You've heard some wonderful stories in mining over the last few days. Um, you know, just about every company you've, you've heard here, I'd say, is not a buy, it's a strong buy. Um, it's great to see the juniors getting funded again and some great exploration opportunity. So I just wanted to just touch on, on gold and its importance in our history. Um, really, there's been five main resource booms in Australia. The biggest and by far the most significant for us has been the discovery of gold in the 1850s in Victoria. A little graph on the side shows you the impact of that on our GDP. But importantly, before gold was discovered in Victoria, Australia's population was 400,000 people. In three years, it was 1.8 million people. And it was really the discovery of gold in, a, in, uh, in Victoria that built the city of Melbourne. Um, the next real boom, there's a lot of minor booms attached to these things with discoveries of gold in other places. But really the, the boom of the 1880s to the 1920s, the mineral boom that saw the discovery of gold in Kalgoorlie, the discovery of Broken Hill in the 1880s, the company that built BHP. And of course, towards the end of that, Mount Isa. Substantial resource booms, which built the economy of Queensland. Broken Hill built the economy of New South Wales. Again in the 60s, the recognition of coal, iron ore, building the Pilbara, aluminium and nickel, really building major regional towns, and in that phase, the city of Perth was built. We had the 70s and 80s resources booms, essentially energy booms, and the current resource boom that we're in today, really fueled by um, growth in Southeast Asia, and one not to be under-recognised. You know, what we've really got going on in China and India today is really the, the biggest industrial revolution the world's ever seen. It's not the UK with industrialisation or the Americas. This one has a third to 40% of the world's population involved, and it's taking their intensive use of metals per capita from an extremely low level to a much higher level. We don't know what that is. But we do know it will affect all metals at some time in its phase. We don't know how long it'll run. It could run for 50 years. Iron ore and energy have been the forefront of that phase. It's now moving into the industrial metals. And every metal will have its day, including gold, through that process. You've heard a lot about these things. Um, and I don't want to lecture about resources and risk and the impacts on gold too much. So I've decided to change my presentation a little bit over the last few hours and really talk to you about the change world that we're in and the impact that that has on gold and importantly the impact and risks that that can have on us achieving these higher gold prices that everyone's dreaming that we can get. Now active risk taking is a core element of any dynamic economy in any innovative society. Uh, the US is the classic example of that. The US really only has innovation. Before you, before you panic about walking outside, you need to understand that you've been infiltrated by this secret society of people called the Risk Society. And they're all over the world and they've changed the world as we know it or have known it and they've probably changed it forever. So what is risk society? Risk society is a society increasingly preoccupied with the future and also with safety, and one which generates the actual notion of risk. Risk society, as explained by probably the foremost leader in this, this area of sociology, Ulrich Beck, uh, came, to, came to fame after the Chernobyl disaster. He classifies risk society as a systematic way of dealing with hazards or insecurity induced, induced by modernity itself. So modernity is an interesting term. A changed world from industrial society to modern society. Modernity or modern society really is a society, society unlike any previous society which lives in the future rather than the past. It's a society that examines itself 
and in turn changes itself by the use of media and social guilt. That comes primarily through its focus on safety and environment in areas where environmental risk has become pr the predominant product and today not just an unpleasant or manageable side effect of the historic industrial society. Whilst humans have always been exposed to levels of risk, most of these have been due to natural forces or non-human forces. And modern society today is exposed to risk, ever recognising risk, such as pollution, newly recognised illnesses that we've never known of before, crime, that are really the result of modernisation itself. The world's become infatuated with risk, become infatuated with safety and infatuated with the environment. External risks and manufactured risks are a high level of human agency in the introduction of risk and mitigation of risk. We invent potential risks. We invent virtual risks. We then implement solutions these days to try and resolve them. We no, manner, no longer manage real risk. Hence the future potential disasters are attempted to be mitigated by policy rules regulation and guidelines which try and try to manage the potential that these things uh, can impact as if they occur. So that takes us to another area of modern sociology, one of reflexive modernisation, which is really the phase we're in today. Changes brought on by the realisation of these modern ideals. So as a consequence of institutions of modern society, and as they start to crumble in the face of economic and cultural globalisation, the state starts to lose its importance and the rise of transnational forces, NGOs, the environments, the environmentalists, um, protesting in the streets today, uh, a real example of that. Family splitting apart. There's rising divorce rates in the world. There's a favoured flexibility of work. Women's liberation is a real thing. The world's changed to lose its supportive function in this process. Religion is being reduced to a cultural artefact. And traditional political action is boycotted because of a lack of identification of party goals. That results in solarity losing momentum and the rise of individualism that we're seeing today. Driven by moral entrepreneurs. Moral entrepreneurs are abundant in this world today. A moral entrepreneur is an individual group or a formal organisation that seeks to influence a group or adopt or maintain, or maintain a social ideology. Moral entrepreneurs take the lead in labelling particular behaviour and spreading and popularising this label through society. The moral entrepreneur typically presses for the creation of enforcement of a norm for any number of reasons, altruistic or selfish. I'll give you an example there. Adani coal mine. The Adani coal mine will provide energy for 200,000 people in India who currently rely on burning dung and would, with far more adverse impacts to the environment than the actual movement of coal. How selfish are we to deny these people the opportunity to have a lifestyle or a standard of life that we exist, expect in the Western world? And such individuals or these moral entrepreneurs, and I can think of one recently called Greta, and she's only 16 years old, an individual holds the power to generate moral panic in the world. The moral panic is a very important endpoint to these things. It's where we are today. It's a feeling of fear spread amongst many people that some evil threatens the well-being of society. It's a process arousing social concern over an issue 
usually the work of these moral entrepreneurs and by mass media. And mass media uses a diverse array of media technologies and you've got them all on your phones, it's Facebook and Instagram and all these things that do this that reach a large audience via mass communication. So what the hell is this bloke talking about? Why is this important? Well, it really explains the explosion of red tape and regulation. It strangles and changes the life and the industry that we knew or that we think we had. Overregulation and the risk society doctrine is the biggest threat to the gold mining industry. There may be many economic reasons why gold can go up, many fundamental reasons why gold should go up, but unless gold is allowed to go up and gold can be mined and produced without overregulation, it's always going to be stifled. We're not running out of resources. We're not running out of gold. The demand dynamics and the supply demand forces which control their pricing are increasingly impacted by these ideological forces and regulation driven risk, society and modernity. Risk society itself evolves as red tape. Now in Australia, every new government elected in the past two decades has done so by declaring it's going to tackle regulation and the red tape burden. In fact, my hero John Howard in his 1996 election promise said he would reduce the amount of red tape and regulation enveloping small business by 50% during his first three years. He achieved less than five. In 2014, Deloitte published a paper called Get Out of Your Own Way, Unleashing Productivity, which estimated that the red tape cost of governments, both federal and state, to the economy was $96 billion. By 2016, the last decent paper I could find on it by the Melbourne Institute of Public Affairs estimated that was 166, I'm sorry, $176 billion, 11% of GDP of economic output was lost due to red tape. So let's put that in perspective. That's 1.2 times the federal health budget. It's 1.4 times the federal education bu budget. If we can get government to remove red tape, our economy will grow much stronger. The definitions of red tape, for those who don't know, I'll spell them out. It's, the, it's sort of strangling the goose that laid the golden egg. Collection of sequence or forms of procedures that gain bureaucratic approval for something, especially when oppressive, complex, and time consuming. Obstructive official use or time consuming bureaucracy. Just think today of the ever increasing examples that are holding up or denying resource developments or just about anything that we do, the time frames that are taken to resource projects. Time to push back in this industry. Overregulation and the cost of overregulation continues to grow exponentially. And it's unchecked and it's unaccountable to the public, our industry, or our economy. Every positive argument you've heard today in favour of gold in the past few days, and every positive mining story you've heard over the last two days is potentially at risk of achieving the outcomes unless we can arrest this situation. So in completion, I say, go gold. Thank you.